EU refugee quotas win a major court battle. But could the policy cause the bloc to fall apart? I'll speak to the EU's head of migration. I'm Imran Garda, and today's newsmaker is Europe's refugee crisis. Hungary and Slovakia, battling poor economies and riding a wave of populist fever, say there's no way they'll host refugees from countries like Syria. They took the European Union to court and lost. It's a major victory for the bloc's mandatory quota system. But is it enough to force Budapest and Bratislava to open their borders? In a moment, I'll ask that very question to the EU's head of migration and ask him if there could be backlash. But first, this report from Yvette McCullough, who went to the biggest influencer of EU refugee policy, Berlin. It was an unprecedented crisis, an overwhelming human need that pulled the heartstrings of one of Europe's most stoic leaders and challenged the limits on Europe's capacity to help or to care. When Angela Merkel told refugees to come, they came. 890,000 of them reached Germany in 2015. And as the gateways on an overwhelmed Europe began to close, Merkel was one of those pushing for all EU members to share the load with a quota system. The EU committed to relocate 160,000 refugees from Italy and Greece within two years. That was revised down to 98,000. But now, two years on, the EU has taken in less than half of that. The mandatory quotas were forced through despite several EU members voting against them, creating a schism with many central and eastern states. Poland, the Czech Republic and Hungary have now refused to take it anymore. The climate there is, to put it frankly, a bit more hostile. These states have been sealed off uh, in the communist bloc uh, for many, many years. And although uh, this has changed, um, as we know, 25, 30 years ago, there is still a lot of history uh, uh, of that sealing off um, against anything that comes in from the outside. Earlier this month, Hungary and Slovakia lost their challenge to the quotas in the European Court of Justice, a ruling that may see some EU members sealing themselves off even further. Everybody reassured the others that uh, we're going to fight and we're not going to um, give up uh, our positions regarding illegal migration and, and regarding the quotas. As Germany heads towards national elections, the refugee crisis has consumed much of the campaign conversation. Vying for her fourth term as Chancellor, Merkel remains unapologetic about the need for the quotas. Her main rival, Martin Schulz, has been pushing for a tougher stance and economic sanctions against states who fail to comply, something Merkel has now also hinted at. Eine gemeinsame europäische Herausforderung und Pflichtaufgabe aller Mitgliedsländer der Europäischen Union. But even here in Germany's regional parliament, there are those who feel the quotas and Merkel's hand in them were a mistake. Like the far right party and rising political weight, alternative for Germany. We have to have a European solution. But due to the fact that Mrs. Merkel went forward without debating this with, her, with our European partners, there is a division. It has less to do with cultural or other problems. We do need immigration, but this is based on the Anglo-Saxon model of uh, selective uh, immigration. These quotas are just a drop in the immense ocean of refugees who have come to Europe, a symbol of unity that appears to have failed. A possibility would be that some member states just progress in the sense that they form a new alliance, a new union within the European Union, defining a common policy, um, and let those other member states who have these resistances um, decide. 
Will pressuring EU members to fall in line on refugee policy see the EU fracture? And will it be refugees who feel the effects of the fallout the most? Yvette McCullough in Berlin for the Newsmakers. Well, I'm joined now from New York by European Commissioner for Migration, Home Affairs and Citizenship, Dimitris Avramopoulos. Sir, thank you very much for joining us. Let me ask you very directly, has the relocation plan been a failure? Well, I wouldn't say that it is a, a failure. Uh, we have kept working on that, uh, and during the last months, I can tell you, we had very, very positive results. Approximately 35,000 people have been relocated. And this uh, program will continue even after the 27th uh, of September. It is true also to say that in the beginning it was not working. Some member states were very reluctant to be part of this program, but now everybody has realized that it is one solution, a solution uh, to this big uh, problem. So I am very optimistic for the future. But beyond relocation, we have also resettlement. We encourage member states uh, to start uh, uh, taking in uh, people from third countries. This will also, will, would also facilitate uh, uh, legal procedures for the ones who want to come to Europe. Yeah, you, you gave me those numbers, and that sounds impressive, but in context, as we heard from our reporter just a few minutes ago, the EU collectively agreeing to relocate 160,000 refugees from Italy and Greece within two years. That was then revised down to 98,000. And now, two years on, the EU has taken in less than half of that. That was the number you gave me. So, over that two-year timeline, I'll ask you again then, with all of that in mind, has the relocation been a failure? I, I, I repeat what I said before. In the beginning, yes, that was the goal, to reach the level of 160,000 people. We had some problems to overcome, but given the fact that uh, the numbers have gone down, have subsided, also thanks uh, to the implementation of the EU-Turkey statement, uh, uh, things are better managed right now. Yes, we didn't reach this goal, but there are not so many people to be relocated. But what we do now, is exactly to um, convince the last remaining four member states to be part of this scheme. And uh, the very first signs show that uh, it will be uh, very successful. But things have changed. Yes, the initial goal was that. And I, I don't hide that in the beginning I was afraid that uh, this uh, program would fail. But it's not the case right now. More than 1.2 million people have already been in, in Europe. We shouldn't forget that. The relocation scheme has started working. More and more member states have started opening their doors to welcome uh, the ones who are eligible. You know that uh, this was also a problem, especially in the beginning. Now, the ones who are eligible to be relocated, uh, given the fact that we have decided to step up this, uh, this program, the implementation, things are getting better. Uh, I'm, I'm interested that you mentioned the success of the Turkey-EU deal because despite all the tensions between Turkey and the bloc, and they have been many over the past 18 months, there's been some terrible name-calling as well, particularly between Turkey and Germany, Germany-Turkey, the Netherlands, and so on. Despite all of that, that deal is standing by and large. Yet, when you look at the European Union, it seems as if the European Union can't get its own house in order. As you mentioned, you're still trying to convince four member states to be on board. This was supposed to be a test of unity. So, what's going on within the European Union? Is there no unity? You have a point there. I was always saying that uh, it wouldn't be the economic crisis that would put in danger the European project, but rather uh, how to handle the migration crisis. because. There, the two basic principles upon which the European unity stands, responsibility and uh, solidarity, were put in doubt. But as I said in the beginning, things, uh, things have changed right now. And coming back to the eu turkey statement, yes, I'm following with great attention what's happening in Europe. I would advise uh, all reactions uh, to be done in a calm way, because what is the, 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 the most important point on that? The European Union needs Turkey, and Turkey needs European Union. So we must keep working as uh, strong partners, because it is beneficial both for Turkey and the European Union. And I would like to tell something more. We should commend Turkey, because right now more than three million refugees are uh, hosted in, in your country. And uh, this is something very positive. On the other hand, yes, Turkey 
is implementing this EU Turkey statement. And thanks to that, the numbers have subsided. We have to continue working on that. On the other hand, let me be clear on that. I believe that all these problems that have occurred during the last months will be put aside and the European path of Turkey will be open. Do you feel let down by Poland, by the Czech Republic, by Hungary? Have they let you down? Not really. Uh, here, let me, let, me make, let me make a distinction between governments and states. I think you will agree with me that governments come and go, but the states are there. So their uh, leadership some decades ago made the big decision to be members of the European Union. And I understand that they will keep working and following up the same path in the future. So, yes, they reacted in a way that we didn't agree. Because, as I said before, they have put in doubt solidarity, which is, I would say, the main principle upon which the European project is built. But things are changing. You know, you are aware of the ruling of the European Court of Justice. They have lost. Yep. But we they didn't uh, certainly come lost. out in an enthusiastic way that we won. Fair enough. But right now we have given them we have given them an opportunity to change their stance. Certainly. And I believe that it's a question of time to okay. do it. But you, you you're saying you know the ruling is a, is a positive thing, right? They've been saying they're answerable to the people who elected them, not to you, not to anyone in Brussels, right? And now you have the European uh, Union's High Court saying that they must accept their assigned number of migrants, no matter what, by force if necessary. Isn't this a recipe for more Brexits? Isn't this a recipe for their people saying, I'm sorry, I elected someone in my presidential palace or in my parliament. I didn't elect some bureaucrat in Brussels to tell me what to do. Isn't this a recipe for the European Union breaking further apart? The fact well, that they feel lectured by Brussels. Let's finish once and forever with this myth about the bureaucrats in Brussels. I have been from the other side of the table as minister of my country many years before and I know how the institutions work. It is not as it has been interpreted that Brussels is trying to impose its will. Everything is decided together, jointly. And all these decisions that were made two years ago, they are biding for these member states. So they are legally, morally, and politically obliged to comply to these decisions. And uh, believe me, I th I'm sure that there are reasonable thoughts right now behind this stance adopted by these countries. We have not closed the door. We try a lot. I have opted for the dialogue in order to convince these member states uh, and the last uh, well, solution would be uh, to somehow punish them. But we are not there yet. You know, it is very difficult to work within this uh, block of different nations. And uh, what is uh, my, my, my big concern is that uh, some of these governments, they come back to national policies. The decision that was made after the Second World War was to create a united space where freedom, democracy, rule of law would prevail. And we managed to, 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 to do it and enjoy it. It is a unique paradigm in mankind's history. So we have to uphold and defend it. And we, would, we shouldn't let this kind of problems to divide Europe. You say they have an obligation morally, politically, legally, and otherwise. But after the EU High Court decision against them, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban said, quote, the real battle is just beginning. What do you think is behind that message to you? What do you think he's trying to tell you? I think that this kind of statements are addressed to the domestic audience. So you read nothing into it. You don't feel he's sending you a message at all. You don't feel as if he's saying, I'm going to fight you tooth and nail until the very end. Well, I was very clear on what I said before. Unfortunately, during the last years, we see with great concern that many politicians uh, are turning towards uh, uh, their domestic audience. And uh, through populist and nationalist uh, rhetorics, uh, um, they send this kind of messages. 
I interpret this kind of message as a reaction, but on the other hand, I don't think that uh, the leadership of these countries would ever make the mistake uh, to open the door, the exit door, for their countries in mm -hmm. Europe. They would be held, held accountable to their history and to their nation. Very finally, sir, you're a diplomat, you're a deal maker, you have a, a long and distinguished career. Has this been your toughest battle yet as a diplomat and a deal maker? Definitely, definitely. And to be frank, uh, since nobody's listening to us now, <laughs> when I was designated commissioner in charge of uh, security, uh, home affairs, uh, migration, and citizenship, I would never imagine that this portfolio uh, would be on the top, not only of the European, of the global agenda. You see, both migration and security right now are uh, the big priorities across the world. And here in the United Nations, these issues will be also discussed thoroughly. But the answer is very clear. I am confronted with a huge challenge, but believe me, I'm very happy that I have this very important role to play in the name of Europe that I hold dear in my heart. Dimitris Avramopoulos, it's been a pleasure talking to you, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. And join us tomorrow when we'll be delving deeper into the refugee crisis and how it's affecting Angela Merkel's chances for a fourth term as chancellor. But coming up in this show, Israel's Supreme Court tells ultra-Orthodox Jews serve in the military or serve time in jail. And we ask, why is it so hard for Bosnian rape victims to find justice? Welcome back to the Newsmakers. Another court ruling is making waves, this time in Israel. Justices knock down a government deal that exempts Orthodox Jews from military service. The judges told religious leaders that studying the Torah is no excuse for not joining the army. And they gave the Knesset one year to come up with an alternative plan. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu may need one. Ultra-Orthodox Jews make up an important wing of his fragile coalition. And the issue of conscription has sparked protests from both the faithful and their critics. Ultra-Orthodox Jews, this is a show of faith. It's also a demonstration against a high court ruling which could now require some of them to serve in the Israeli military. The court overturned a law which gave mass exemptions from the military draft for seminary students, labelling it unreasonable and unconstitutional. In Israel, Jewish men and women can be drafted once they turn 18 years old. Men are required to serve two years and eight months. Women need to serve two years. Military service is viewed by some as the great equalizer in Israeli society. Because no matter a person's background, they each have an obligation to contribute. But the ultra-Orthodox community also known as the Haredi, has not faced the same duties. And that has caused friction. This is why we have come to politics. Conscription for everybody, work for everybody. Benjamin Netanyahu can no longer continue to wiggle out all the time. Military conscription is for everybody, not only for the suckers who don't have a party in his coalition. Haredi have long argued that studying the Torah is vital for the survival of the Jewish faith, and that forcing their flock to become part of a secular service could irrevocably change their community. Some Haredi do serve in the army, combining their religious studies with their military service but they can also face recrimination from their community for doing it. This is an effigy of a Haredi soldier which was strung up earlier this year. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government has been given a year to change the legislation. The Haredi parties are a key part of his alliance. But will the political cost of a more egalitarian military service be too divisive for Israeli society.
Natalie Bohunen, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined by the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Yitzhak Pindris. He's a member of the ultra-Orthodox ultra United Torah Judaism Party. Also from West Jerusalem is Dov Lipman. He is a former member of the Knesset representing the secular Yesh Atid Party. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure having both of you on the program. Dov, let me begin with you. Should the ultra-Orthodox be drafted into the Israeli army? I don't think I can answer that question in a definitive, all-across-the-board way. It's a very complex issue. There are young men who study the religious texts day and night. This is their one pursuit. This is a real, real service to the Jewish people, and they should not be disturbed from that learning at all. And even those who aren't necessarily studying all day, uh, they should have a few years to study, to be what we call the yeshiva, to build themselves up spiritually. But then at a certain point, I do believe that those who aren't studying day and night should either do army service or some kind of national service at a certain point and pave the way for them to enter into the workforce. So it's not a black and white issue, but I certainly would not say draft everyone. And we have to find each person their own place in their own time. Yitzhak, does that sound reasonable to you? I have to say that uh, I think for the first time in my public life, I agree with Dov Lippmann. I think whoever is studying has to be staying <laughs> and studying. Whoever is not has to serve. Yeah, I think it's uh, very obvious. Yitzhak, the Knesset lawmakers deferred... I have to agree. I have certainly, to say... Certainly, they de deferred the conscription. Should the courts have stayed out of it and not gotten involved afterwards? First of all, I, I want to say two things. First of all, as a fact, no doubt that a court that uh, gets involved in a Knesset passing a law the third time means something on the court and says really the court is, uh, is not connected to what's happening in Israel because the Knesset by the end of the day is, is, a, is a political place that's elected by the nation. But outside of that, I want to be practically. I think uh, almost each uh, individual in Israel and each public uh, servant in Israel understands that there's no way to draft uh, uh, guys that are studying uh, by taking them to jail or anything like that, because it's just it's not going to happen. What is is going to do that? People that wanted to serve in the army uh, are going to want to identify with those uh, yeshiva boys, the, the guys that are studying and uh, being with them. They're not going to go to the army. That's the only thing that a change of the, the the what's happening now or a law that's that's happening now is could happen through that decision. I don't think anything real more than that is going to happen. Yitzhak, how do you feel about the idea that the Supreme Court justices ruled 8 to 1 in favor of this? That's massive, right? You're saying they're out of touch with what's going on. It was 8 to 1. This is a pillar of democracy. Uh, but, uh, there is... No, no, it's not... A, it's, I, uh, let's, 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 let's make uh, things very obvious. This is something that's been going on between the Orthodox and the non-Orthodox since the uh, uh, Israeli state was established in 48. It's not something new. And these are things that this, there is a disagreement between uh, generally the, the public and non-religious people then, uh, and the Orthodox. That's something that's been going on forever. Of course, uh, the Supreme Court, which uh, rules by the Israeli law, are not uh, people that are uh, affiliated with the ultra-Orthodox community. No one of the ultra-Orthodox community it joined ever the Supreme Court. And it's, it's a group of people, very obvious, and I think uh, from other countries you know how it looks like. It's a certain group of people with a certain status that they're a part of those judges. So it's not something that I'm surprised. Wow, I don't believe it. Well, those people, that's what all of them think. That's what all of them think. We knew that beforehand. We knew that today. That's a difference between democracy. And you know what's happening today in Israel, that 30% of the children of the first grade are under the ultra-Orthodox education and the private uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox education. So that means something about what's happening to Israel. And that threats a lot, the, I would say, the public and if, at least uh, that group that the Supreme Court are part of that group. They're very threatened by uh, the growth of the ultra-Orthodox. I feel it as a matter of fact in Jerusalem. There's today over 40% of ultra-Orthodox, over 65% of Orthodox in Jerusalem. And a lot of people are frightened of it. Uh, so they're trying to pass all kinds of laws. I see. But, uh, you know, it's not going to help. Let me, Dov, let me ask you my first question the other way around. Let me ask you, if 
somebody says, I'm ultra-Orthodox, and I study in a yeshiva, and I should be absolutely blanket, categorically exempt from serving in Israel's army, from serving in the IDF. Would you go along with that? Well, first of all, I'm very proud to live in a country where on such a difficult issue of religion and state and religious issues, you know, we live in a world where religious issues are not dealt with in the way that we're having a conversation right now or even in a democratic way in the courts or the parliament. They're usually fighting in the streets, and we're not, and I'm very proud that we're having this dialogue. Uh, again, somebody who is absolutely studying day and night, this is their pursuit. That's a service for the Jewish people. That's a service for the state of Israel, and we bless them, and they should be supported. And it's not just me. I someone who's religious, even the chairman of my party, if he was sitting here, Yair Lapid, he would be saying the same thing. The controversy is about those who might be in sort of an in-between stage where they're saying they're learning day and night, but they're really not. And again, boys who are in yeshiva, I respect them. This is a tremendous thing. My own son spent years in yeshiva. I did as well. We have to figure out the right balance. It doesn't have to be army service. It could also be national service. It doesn't have to be army service in the regular army. We can find special units and ways to make them comfortable. But I do want to pick on the last point that the deputy mayor mentioned, my dream would be that there will be ultra-Orthodox members of the Supreme Court in Israel, and that will happen in a generation or two as those who are not studying day and night slowly find their way to balance, on the one hand, being Talmudic scholars, being fervently religious, but also being part of society. I can tell you that my father, of blessed memory, from a, we're from an ultra-Orthodox yeshiva background, uh, was a judge in the United States government. It exists in America. It can exist here in Israel as well, and we're in that process. And I believe in a generation or two we'll get there as we try to work out these issues together. There's a feeling amongst some as they've responded, and we saw some of it when it came to the clashes with, with the police as well, that, listen, we follow God's law. We don't follow a secular law or, or man-made law. Is that really helpful when it comes to I'll, I'll this, start, this situation? Yeah. I'll, start really, I'll start really with what Dov really said. I'll start with what Dov ended with. It is no way, okay, an ultra-Orthodox Jew uh, would be part of the... And I'm saying an ultra-Orthodox. There's maybe uh, other uh, uh, groups in Israel that are Orthodox, but they're not ultra-Orthodox, and they see things different. We see very clear that it's against our Bible, against our tradition, against our religion to be part of a court that rules not by rules of the Bible, okay? There's a difference between doing that in Israel, which is a Jewish state, than doing that in the United States, which is a Christian state, basically. Not a, of course, not a Jewish state. Okay, that's the difference between being a, a judge in the United States and being a judge in Israel. In Israel, we think it's against the Jewish law. and That's why there's no way we're going to be part of it. And we're going to do anything we can that the game should go through uh, the democratic uh, institution, which is the, the parliament. One more point than what you're asking, and I'm not running away from the question. There's one thing that's very clear, okay? We as Jews, for 2,000 years, we sacrificed our lives, we sacrificed our, our, our everything we can to keep those people in, in studying. We'll do anything we can, and even more than that, to make sure that the guys that are sitting and studying will stay in yeshiva, no matter what, how they'll call it, and however they'll say it. It's very obvious and very clear. And what Gafri is saying is also very simple. We're going to do everything to get it back into the Knesset and use the parliament. And even the parliament, it's not going to work. Yes, very clear. No one is going to go to the army. If they'll arrest 80,000 yeshiva guys, let them arrest them. Dov, when you look at some of the practicalities, when you see that perhaps practically speaking, some Haredi men, even if they go into the army, they might not want to serve alongside women. They might be a lot of practical issues to deal with here. Isn't it going to be more of a headache for the IDF? Why don't they just, you know, leave it as things stand, leave it as is? So first of all, uh, I, I believe that uh, the accommodations can be made and are being made. I've visited with uh, ultra-Orthodox uh, people on the highest level who are in the army at different levels of their lives, and the accommodations are made. And sometimes if uh, something is violated and it wasn't dealt with properly, we have to deal with it. And it's part of the challenge of a Jewish state in 2017. But as we look back of 2,000 years of our history, as the deputy mayor mentioned, uh, the 2,000 years of history were not people who sat and studied Torah day and night as their only pursuit. 
Talmud, the greatest rabbis combine together uh, their learning together with work. And we have our, our traditions all teach us that a father is obligated to teach a son a trade. We had armies that were filled with the most religious people. The challenge of our time is to make sure that those who are really studying Torah day and night, that exclusive elite group, that they should be taken care of and they can do so, and that the rest not, God forbid, be dragged into an army which will hurt them spiritually, religiously, and not in any way to be going into study halls and arresting anybody, but to work together so that they're serving in the army if they choose to, in national service. There are many, many options out there in which they could serve the country. That will do a tremendous amount, first of all, for them as they begin to make their way into the workforce where they combine being religious and studying and supporting their families with dignity. It'll also do a lot for healing and repairing the Jewish people in Israel where we're dealing with this issue. And like I said before, this is a process. We are working through it. And for me, there's nothing great short of a blessing and a thrill to be part of that process. And as long as we respect one another along the way, I have no doubt they'll be able to reach that proper balance as time goes forward. Yitzhak Pendris, if the standoff continues and we see the government, for want of a better word, trying to enforce this, is this going to hurt the government? Is it going to lose its ultra-Orthodox support? Is this going to hurt Prime Minister Netanyahu politically? I, th I think it's a side issue. Uh, no doubt that uh, Orthodox uh, uh, parties could, could not be part of a coalition of a government that's arresting 80,000 uh, guys that are sitting and studying, and no doubt or trying to change the status quo about uh, uh, students of yeshiva uh, going to the army. No doubt that a government could de like that could not uh, continue and function with a coalition with ultra-Orthodox, no doubt. That's why I think Netanyahu is going to try, try to change uh, that specific law. I do agree with Lipman uh, that there could be an army with Orthodox and uh, with the ultra-Orthodox. I myself served in the army. Uh, I mean, that's something that could be done. And if we're talking about a percentage, yes, we have to go back at the times of King David when 50% was sitting and studying. If 50% of the nation was sitting and studying, the other 50% could uh, serve in the army. When we're talking about 10%, we're far, far, far from the real numbers that have to exist in Israel. Dov, do you expect there to be a big legal fight ahead? There's definitely going to be a lot of maneuvering uh, inside the Knesset. My hope, my hope, my hope is that people will look at the law for what it says, which is not at all going into the yeshivas and dragging people out. That's not going to be happening according to anybody's uh, picture. Even the films that you might be seeing of recent days of, of, of violence in the streets, that's not over this specific law. It's about people who didn't even report to the draft board to get their exemption. There's been no one that's being arrested because of any of the legislation lately. Uh, there definitely will be a legislative battle. I do agree that the, the parliament is the place uh, where this should play out. And then we go to elections at some point whether it's now or in two years from now, people can vote uh, based on what they believe about this and many other issues. And that's, again, part of being part of a democratic state. Uh, there is an ultra-Orthodox population here who are citizens of the country. They have a vote and they have a say. And we respect them. I respect them for standing up for the principles and the values which they believe in, even if we disagree uh, somewhat. I'd like to see a prime minister and some other ministers who actually have a stance about the issue one way or the other and don't sort of go back and forth based on the wind of the political uh, time that we live and what they need to stay in power. But either way, uh, this is all part of a process. It's part of a process which we may not see the end of. It's a few generations as we're trying to work out a Jewish and democratic state and trying to figure out the exact status of those who are studying the Torah, those who are not truly studying the Torah. And uh, there will be a legislative battle. There might be further court battles. Who knows exactly what will be? But that's part of the democratic powers in Israel uh, trying to determine what's best in this issue. And I'm thrilled that we don't live in a dictatorship of any kind where anybody's coming down and saying this is what must be, forcing the way on the people. The people themselves have to work this out, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I've got to move on. But it's been good getting a deep dive on this issue with both of you gentlemen, Yitzhak Pindris and Dov Lipman. I thank you both for joining us on The Newsmakers. these authorities at a different level, they have a responsibility uh, to provide these women with access to justice, but also to reparation, to at least to give them back something, you know, at least, you know, to give them uh, back some of the peace that they have lost in the last two decades now. This is Nusreta Sivac. During the Bosnian war, she was detained in a mine outside Sarajevo. 
and systematically raped for more than two months. Tens of thousands of Bosniak women have suffered a similar tragedy. More than two decades later, few have found justice. Amnesty International says fewer than 1% of victims have had their day in court, around 120. The rights group blames bureaucracy and a lack of political will by Bosnian politicians. Amnesty also says a high number of acquittals have intimidated victims from coming forward. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined now from Sarajevo by Bosnia's former defense minister, Emir Sulyagic. In Belgrade is Sonia Biserko. She is the president of the Helsinki Committee for Human Rights in Serbia. And in London, Toby Cadman. He's an international law specialist in the field of war crimes. Thanks, all of you, for joining us. Sonia Biserko, if I can begin with you, ma'am. Has Bosnia failed okay. to provide justice for these thousands of women? Well, I think it did, because uh, the access to justice and the reparations and some kind of compensation is very limited to very few women, about 800. And I think uh, even more uh, bigger problem is the social integration of the, these women than the high unemployment rate, uh, uh, poverty, and many others. And this is, uh, and of course, the trauma, deep trauma, which is not handled properly because there are not enough uh, services which can handle that, except few NGOs who really look after these women. Emir Sulyagic, do you agree that this was badly handled? by Bosnia-Herzegovina over these two decades? Well, it was badly handled by both the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and by the, uh, by the judiciary in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And, and I can only look at that from the point of view of judiciary, which has completely and utterly actually failed to, to, address, um, to address these crimes and to, I mean, I, I understand the difficulties in prosecuting these crimes. I understand the fallout, the difficulties in, in dealing with the fallout. But our, our, prose, our, our, our prosecution uh, was completely, um, completely failed. Toby Cadman, less than 1% of the total estimated number of victims of war crimes of sexual violence have come to court. Is this a failure by design or the fact that they were just swamped, both if you look at the international community trying to help Bosnia-Herzegovina um, rebuild itself and bring about some semblance of peace and justice. Was it failure by design or were, w w were they just all swamped? This government trying to hold itself together, hold Dayton together and make things work. Which one was it? Well, I think it's a, it's a bit of both. Um, obviously, there were a number of cases that were dealt with both on the international and on the national level. Um, I think speaking for the Bosnian War Crimes Chamber, as it became known, um, it failed to address the question of sexual violence, only dealt with a handful of cases because it didn't really have a strategy to deal with it. It didn't have trained personnel to deal with these types of cases. And as Sonia has said, it, it certainly didn't have a well thought out strategy as to what to do after a handful of prosecutions. Um, unfortunately, many of these w women have been left and only, uh, and I think as Emira said as well, is only a handful of NGOs have actually um, made any impact on, on these individuals' lives. But I think the, the biggest problem is that there was no real strategy from a prosecution level, um, certainly from the institution that I worked in for a number of years. There was no real strategy on, on how to address this. And it is a major problem. Um, there are thousands of cases that will never be dealt with. Sonia, why has it been so difficult to get prosecutions when, in many cases, women can actually point out the men who were involved? They can actually point out the men they say had raped them. They say, oh, these guys are from the village next door. I can tell you who it is. Why has it been so difficult to get prosecutions or to even get this taken to court? Well, there are several reasons for that. At the beginning, it was stigma of these uh, women who were, who, it took time for them to break this silence, and they were very courageous, especially to testify in ICTV, ICTY, and later in uh, 
an, a Bosnian court, but uh, I would say the Bosnian court generally was not prepared to identify and to properly pro uh, uh, in, uh, investigate the, those cases. And as you mentioned, there are many people who are going around and living along with these uh, victims, uh, we, women victims. And therefore, there was no political will, I would say, and especially the, uh, because the uh, Bosnian court has over the years, last year's, uh, weakened and decreased, the, uh, has uh, somehow uh, 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 abandoned this sort of uh, strategy of addressing uh, serious crimes, mostly because uh, all these international experts who were part of the court were uh, uh, abolished, and uh, this is due to the Miller and Dodik's, uh, strategy since last uh, several years, 2008, from then all of uh, then. Uh, many of these uh, experts have left the country, and all these cases are uh, mostly uh, documented by the ICY because ICY couldn't handle all of them, so they dealt with many cases to Bosnian court. But unfortunately, not only did the court fail to address, uh, to address these cases, but also society as such, government, uh, and all uh, uh, relevant institutions fail to address the problem of this uh, uh, very vulnerable, highly vulnerable group uh, of victims. Uh, there is law in Bosnia uh, uh, recognizing uh, rape women as, uh, as uh, civil victims, but, uh, and they do have some rights according to this law, but uh, it's not properly implemented. As I mentioned, only 800, I think, persons mm -hmm. have and access to this allowance, monthly allowance, which is about 250 euros. In Republika Srpska, it's only 150. And this is not enough for uh, uh, their already, uh, how should I say, uh, traumatic life. And I think this trauma will never go away. But there is nothing much uh, trying to help them to overcome this trauma and to integrate into society in more, how should I say, uh, uh, with more dignity. and. Um, uh, more, uh, uh, more acceptance from the society. Yes. Emir, there are more than 20,000 wartime sexual violence survivors. Is it true what Sonia pointed out, that it seems as if systemically these women have been abandoned legally and societally because they're not a top priority when it comes to healing the wounds of the past? Well... Well, there was no doubt about that. I mean, uh, I, used to, I used to work as a correspondent from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and, and I know for a fact that in some instances, uh, some of the victims of rape had to be literally smuggled out of their families without their husbands uh, and their families knowing that they were going to uh, The Hague to testify against their rapists. And, and the social stigma uh, was just only one of the challenges. There is also, I mean, speaking of, of stigma and speaking of the society's lack of interest or, or essentially taboo surrounding this issue, there's also the issue of, of sexual violence against men that was, that was perpetrated during the war and, and of at least yeah. two different camps um, and two different um, uh, uh, incidents or series of incidents of of sexual violence against men that, that was never and that it's very likely never to be addressed. Um, the issue with the uh, 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 prosecution of war crimes and, and crimes against humanity in Bosnia and Herzegovina was that it was supposed to have been done on a on a on a schedule. And you know you don't you don't deliver justice on a, on, a, on a time schedule. You don't deliver justice on a budget. You either uh, set out to deliver justice um, and and you know fully aware of of, of the, you know of the goals that you want to reach. Uh, you know the impunity that that you want to uh, to prevent uh, from from uh, taking root in the society and so on and so forth. You don't do that because you have a budget and you have a schedule. And unfortunately, uh, the, the 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 justice, uh, the international well, the international community in Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, especially after 9/11 and after the the focus has shifted from the Balkans, um, has essentially decided that they have had enough and that it was time to put an end to this. And, you know, unfortunately, a lot of the local political class was too happy to oblige. Yeah. A profound point there. You don't deliver justice on a schedule. Toby, let me ask you, legally, help me understand, amid the chaos and brutality of war, many of these women can identify the men they accuse of, of, of raping them, but many cannot, right? Because you have these kind of marauding gangs or militias and so, so on and so forth. When it comes to that... 
who do you hold to account legally when somebody's been been raped but it was done by by a group is it the commanders is it the politicians how does this work well i think i think the first point to well, to reemphasize and, and certainly for me to support is is the point made by 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 Emir. and I, before i answer your question i really want to emphasize this um, the international community made a huge mistake when we first set up the, the Bosnian war crimes chamber because the suggestion was um, and the message was that every case would be dealt with, which unfortunately is not possible because unfortunately justice is um, bound by, by the, the resources that you have available. Um, and the international community left far too early. Um, as Emir said, there were other considerations. And so, so the whole question of, of establishing a, 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 an effective justice and accountability mechanism failed um, for a number of different reasons. Um, so, so, I mean, that's really something that really, really does need to be looked at. It's not you can't put a timeline on, on doing something um, of, of this gravity. You, you know, there needs to be a long-term commitment, which unfortunately there wasn't. Um, in terms of when you can't actually identify the, the person that raped you, I mean, clearly the case doesn't fall with that. Uh, in most of the cases that we dealt with that, that were um, East Bosnia cases, particularly um, around uh, Foča, Visegrad, areas like that, I mean, there, there, were, there, were, there were units that were going around committing, committing these crimes, um, mass rape um, and sexual violence. Um, and there were special houses set up, almost like brothels, where, where young Muslim women were, were raped and tortured. And so all, all that you require to do is to establish a chain of command, who is responsible for that particular unit. Because if the, if the, if the foot soldiers are carrying out these crimes and the commanders are made aware of that, they, they fail to prevent, they fail to, to punish, then there is responsibility. And so there were a number of cases, certainly two cases in the, in the very early days of the Bosnian War Crimes Chamber, um, Jankovic and Stankovic, they were both prosecuted on the basis that they had control, that they didn't actually necessarily carry out the, the crimes themselves. Um, there was also the, the Lukic cousins as well. So, so cases have been brought, but again, it requires a certain level of specialist knowledge right. that um, wasn't always really uh, used in a lot of these cases on the domestic level. And again, a lot of the emphasis was just at the state court, and there, there, was, there were no resources given to the cantonal and district prosecutor's office and courts. So it was a huge failure, right. both by the international community and by the national governments. Sonia, let me ask you, what can the government of Bosnia-Herzegovina yes. do right now, very practically, as an initial step to instill some confidence and to, to make a lot of those women believe that they're taking this seriously now? Well, apart from this judicial justice that we just talked about, I think it's much more important to create social atmosphere that these women are accepted socially, that their status of war or civilian victims is being recognized not only by the government but also from, from society. And I think there should be much more, uh, how should I say, campaigning in favor of these women through media, education, and uh, generally public sphere, because this is something that can repeat and this uh, uh, past from 90s uh, has not been handled properly. Unfortunately, the region hasn't been able to reconcile and Belgrade is denying any involvement or any responsibility for whatever happened in Bosnia. And even the uh, judgment on genocide in Srebrenica was uh, attributed to the Publica Srpska army. So it's totally disconnected from Belgrade. And uh, I think, uh, uh, except that there are NGOs and groups in Belgrade which uh, greatly uh, a campaign against this denial in Serbia and in, uh, in favor of reconciliation and acknowledging uh, the crimes and uh, everything that has been done in Bosnia against Bosniaks. But Bosniak society, I am afraid, is also conservative as others in the region, and this is a very painful fact to confront, to face, and I think this is something that has to be done, worked on very carefully and very uh, systematically. Otherwise, they won't, uh, these women will never have 
any chance to regain their dignity, especially, and, and not to speak about their economical and social survival. Yes, of course, and we hope that there is the political will and money available to give these women the access to medical, psychological and financial assistance that they are asking for. Very powerful report from Amnesty International, which is one of the reasons why we're talking about this. Unfortunately, I'd love to continue talking, but I have to move on. Emir, Sonia and Toby, I thank you all for joining us on The Newsmakers. That's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garta. Next time is the fight against Boko Haram, an unwinnable war. And could Nigeria's counter-terror methods be the reason? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.